morning we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4 verses 21 through 31 and uh, we're going to be looking at the purpose of everything. Wow. Uh, pretty, pretty encompassing. <laughs> the purpose of everything. Now as many of y'all are aware, this morning marks the 10th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. Today we're going to talk about the purpose of everything. Now, this really could be a very long sermon. If I delineated everything, but we're going to paint with a broad brush. You're going to be out for lunch. Good news. But we're going to look at the Old Testament, creation, and even the tragedies like 9-11. See their purpose. Why would God do these things? What is his desire in, in, in this, accomplishing in this? And that's what we're going to look at. So let's stand and read the Word of God together. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the ones of the husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as the time he was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your truth and your word. I pray that you just open us up, open up our hearts to it this morning. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. When Sarah, y'all may be seated, uh, when Sarah and Hagar and Abraham were going through their lives, do you think that they thought their lives would be included in the scripture? Probably not. Or do you think that their lives would reflect, their, what happened in their lives would reflect the law versus the promise? Paul says that this could be looked at as an allegory. What's an allegory? Allegory is an expression by means of symbolic figures and actions of a truth generalized about human existence. Wow, that's a very technical <laughs> definition. Allegory is a story to get a point across, right? It's a, some of them are not true. When we look at the Old Testament, we're going to look at this in a second. They are true, but they also point to another truth as well. Paul's main purpose of showing... The sheer ignorance of wanting to go back to the law. He's saying, this is dumb, guys. Why in the world would you want to go back under the law? You have been released from the law. The law is slavery. The law represents slavery. Where we are children of the promise. We're children of God. What I love about Scripture is there is only one correct interpretation. Anyone that says... Well, I think what this means is, and I think what this means is, if they have two different opinions of what they think that means, at least one of them is wrong, maybe both. The scripture only has one correct interpretation of what's being said, what the author was trying to convey. But there are hundreds of applications that we can receive from the one correct interpretation. 
This part of scripture is very clear. Paul has over and over emphasized the place of the law. What was the purpose of the law? We've looked at as we've gone through, and he's gone over and over again. Why was the law here? If the promise was given, why give the law? Because of transgression, because of our sins, to give us a guardian, to give us a guide until the Holy Spirit came and Christ came. In fact, that's really the main message of Galatians. But since we've looked at that extensively, I want to approach this passage just a little differently. But before I go on, there's many truths that I don't want to pass up. Things that I think are very interesting. Paul says here, the children of the... Well, in the, and he's echoing the Old Testament. The children of the desolate one will be men, more than those who has a husband. Okay, who's the desolate one? Hagar. Hagar. Who does she represent? Slaves. Those that are slaves. Those that are not his chosen. And the one who has a husband? That was Sarah. Those are the children of the promise. We all would like to think, well, maybe I should ask. Don't raise your hands. Who thinks most people are going to heaven? I'd like to say, boy, that's what I think. But the scripture is clear about it. Over and over, the scripture says things like, wide is the gate. It leads to destruction, and many will find it. And narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few will find it. That was Christ. I think the more we reject the truth, the easier it is to fall into Satan's traps. We are here to spread the seed. We are here to spread the truth. We don't make the seeds grow. We cannot convince someone into believing in God, in Christ. We just tell them about it. We proclaim. We are heralds of the truth. We can't convince them. We don't make them grow. We don't make them make fruit. We just spread the seed of the truth as far as possible. That is a great commission to go out and make disciples. That is what we are commanded to do. We don't know who are the children of the desolate one, and who are the children of the promise. I like what uh, uh, Spurgeon said. If the elect were marked with a yellow line up their back, I'd give up preaching and go up to shirt tail lifting. But since the elect are not marked, we don't know. We preach the gospel to all. He also says the children of the promise persecute, are persecuted by the children of the flesh. Are we persecuted by the children of the flesh? Both the allegorical and the actual. Allegorically, we are persecuted by those that want to add the law for salvation. Over and over again, we, the, and this is what Paul is fighting against. Those that want to add the law, they say, oh, to be really saved, yeah, you got to believe in Christ, but you also have to be circumcised and have a right diet, and, and you really need to, to meet on this specific day, and you need to celebrate this specific way. And if you don't do this just right, I don't know. We were persecuted by those. But we are also persecuted those by those that are physical children of the slave woman. Who are the children of Hagar today? Who are the actual children of Hagar? Of Hagar. The Islamic nations. The Islamic nations are the children of Hagar. And the Jews are the children of Isaac. What do the Islamic nations think of the Jews? How real big on them are they? I mean, they openly proclaim we want to drive them into the sea. And the Jews aren't even that religious anymore. What do they think of us? There are two nations that they want to utterly destroy. Israel and America. And guess what? I take that as good news. That is good news. If the children of the desolate one thought we were good and didn't want to bother us, messing up. We're messing up. <clears throat> but even beyond Sarah and Hagar, I want us to understand that the Old Testament isn't just a collection of random stories. This isn't just put together and thought, hmm, 
Well, that's a good story. We'll add that in. Oh, that's a good story. We'll add that in. No, the Old Testament has a very important purpose. They all have a purpose. Some that we know directly, some that we don't understand completely. <clears throat> but have you ever wondered why the Old Testament followed the line of Christ where almost every story is in the direct lineage of Christ? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you read these stories and you realize, line of Christ, 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 line of Christ. And this was written pre-Christ. It wasn't like there was a billion stories out there and they went, well, this is the only line that's important. No, it was, okay, this is the line, this is the line, this is the line, and here comes Christ. It was almost like the author knew what was going on. Novel concept. <clears throat> there are many great analogies found in the Old Testament, and ultimately everything is pointing us to Christ, but we also must be careful not over-analyzing, uh, analogizing everything. I want to say this. First of all, the Old Testament is so important in pointing us to Christ. First of all, the stories that are there are true. They actually happen. But they also are representations of Christ. Uh, the main things are the plain things. Uh, one of my favorite pastors is Alan Strabeck. He says, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And he's absolutely correct. But it was really funny one time, my two favorite pastors, R.C. Sproul and Alan Strabeck, on the same day, R.C. Sproul talked about uh, David and Nathan's son who has been crippled. Jonathan's, Jonathan's son who had been crippled. Sorry. Lost my brain for a second. And how Jonathan, uh, Jonathan's son was brought to the table of David and how he was crippled and, and how this pointed us to how we were brought to Christ and we couldn't be brought there ourselves and all this. And he said that, that's amazing and wonderful and, and really pointed us to Christ. I mean, that that really happened, but also it was an analogy of us with Christ. And then Alistair Bagg said, same day came on and said, now some people say that this whole thing with David and the cripple and it is about no, it's that showing that David was a nice guy. I love Alistair Beck. He's wrong. He is trying to overreact against this making analogies where they don't really fit or exist. But anything that points to the truth of Christ in the Old Testament is true. Christ points to these amazing things. He says, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, on the pole. So must the Son of Man. Now when that was lifted up, what happened? When they looked to the serpent on the pole, what happened to them? They were healed. They had been struck down with a terrible, terrible disease. And, and, and the snakes had been biting them. And, and, and they were healed. Who thought at the time, this represents Christ? And unless Christ had said that, if someone said that was a representation of Christ being put up on the cross, we would have said, you're a fool. But Christ said, no, no, no. That was foreshadowing me. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadowed Him, points to Him. It's also true. It also happened. Calvin said this about making analogies. <clears throat> he went on for a little bit of a rant, but I thought it was pretty good. I try to take the most important pieces. This is uh, John Calvin's commentary on Galatians. He says, Origen and many others along with him have seized the occasion of torturing Scripture in every possible ma manner away from the true sense. They conclude that the literal sense is too mean and poor and that under an outer bark of the letter there lurks a deeper mystery which cannot be extracted but by beating out allegories. And this they have no difficulty in accomplishing, for speculation, which appears to be ingenious, has always been preferred, and always will be preferred by those who, but, uh, as, according to, uh, as opposed to solid doctrine. Paul certainly does not mean that Moses wrote this, the history for the purpose of being turned into an allegory, but points out in what way the history had been made to answer a present subject. This is done by observing a figurative representation of the church there delineated. 
and a mystical interpretation of this sort which is not inconsistent with the truth and literal meaning. When a comparison was drawn between the church and the family of Abraham, as the house of Abraham was then the true church, so it is beyond all doubt that the principal and most memorable of events which happened in it are so, so many types to us. As circumcision in sacrifice and the whole Levitical priesthood, there were all an, where was an allegory. And there is an allegory at this present day in our sacraments. So there was likewise in the house of Abraham. But this does not involve departing from the literal meaning. What they were doing, and this becomes higher criticism, and, and it, uh, they would open up a passage. <clears throat> and they go, listen to this, O Job. And they go, now, this isn't talking about listening. What you're doing is you're, you're listening beyond. You should, And they take the literal meaning and destroy it to make an allegory. Paul did not do this. He said, this really happened. And this is the literal meaning. And tying to the literal meaning is this allegory, which makes sense. Just the same with David and his table. This really happened. It really happened this way. And this allegory ties directly to what he doesn't destroy what was being said when they go and destroy the scripture, making the allegory, beating it, thinking that the literal meaning is wrong. You know you're in trouble. So beware of that. <clears throat> he continues, uh, so the problem isn't with allegories when they fit. The problem is when we depart from the literal interpretation to make it into an allegory, as which is done by people about Adam and Eve. This is hilarious to me. There are Christians today that say, I believe in God, I believe in Christ. Adam and Eve never really exist. existed. It was an allegory. It was a story. It was to get a point across. Fools. Fools. Stop making noise. <laughs> They're being fools. Because Adam and Eve had children. And their children had children. And their children... Children, 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 wait, you can drive it all the way down to where Christ is. Was it an allegory? At what point did it turn from an allegory to true people? They just don't like the miracle of creation. So beware when they want to allegorize it out of its literal meaning. Now I think it's important that we look at the way the world is structured. What do I mean by that? What I want to focus on this Sunday is everything has a purpose. <clears throat> we somehow walk around knowing that this world is created, but forgetting the purpose of His creation. Everything in this world has been created by a Creator for a specific purpose. Why did God create the world? Why did He create the world the way He did? Why did He create it at all? Well, first of all, it'd be hard to be living lost in space. So oh, sorry. Why did God create everything like he did? Let us review really quickly. God has established two types of revelation. The first is called general, general revelation. This is Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been made clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and things that have been made so man is without excuse. <clears throat> God has revealed us himself through his creation, to a point where man has no excuse to say there is no God. Now this is only part of God's revelation to man. Even though God has chosen to reveal himself in this way, he has not revealed enough of it. Of for a person to experience salvation. He hasn't revealed enough to show the truth of how to be saved. He's shown enough that man is without excuse. So those that stand there and say there is no God, they are, by definition, fools. A fool says in his heart there is no God. Because if you look around, you're a fool to say there is no God. That this just happened. Just like it would be Wrong to say that this building just happened. Someone stumbled across it. How do we know when we stumble and look across things that... <clears throat> this is an arrowhead, not just a funny shape of rock. 
Because we see design. If there's design, there must be a designer. Creation tells us nothing about Christ and his work on the cross, though. That is why God gave his second line of revelation. His second line is called special, special revelation. Special revelation. This is where God spoke to and through man to reveal himself more deeply. Has he revealed himself completely? No. He's infinite. We're finite. But he has revealed how man is to be made right with God along with everything else that is revealed in the scripture. Special revelation is limited to scripture only though. Beware of anyone pushing private revelation where God has revealed something special to them that contradicts the word of God. For God never contradicts himself. God told me it was okay to go ahead and have an affair. I mean, that was me. I mean, that was God. How can I say that? I can't. It violates the word of God. <clears throat> God never contradicts himself. The scripture is the final authority. If it is clearly condemned in his word, it is always condemned. So what is the point of creating this world? Why did he create this world? What was the purpose of creation? To reveal aspects of himself through his creation. To reveal himself to us. We know God is a God of order and he made his creation with immense order. We know that God is a God that is vast. So his creation is vast that even with all of our technology, we can't even see the end of his creation. We know that God is beautiful because he has beauty in his creation. Creation reveals things about God. <clears throat> and it goes beyond that to relations, relationally. God wanted us to understand just a little bit of his triune relationship. So he created Ladies and gentlemen, he created the relationship of father and son so that we would begin to understand his relationship, father and son. Does it perfectly mimic it? No, but it helps us understand it. Do you think God just happened to say, I'm going to create it this way? No, he had a purpose for it. To help us understand the soft side of unconditional love, he gave us mothers. To help us understand the tough side of unconditional love, he gave us fathers. What I'm trying to point out is God did not create anything or do anything just because. Why did God do that? Because. Just felt like it. No good reason. Why did he do it? He had a purpose for it. God is not a God of, well, anything will do. I mean, you know, you, have you had anyone ask you, where would you like me to place this? Say, uh, anywhere. Right? Is God like that? He says, uh, angel says, yeah, where do you want me to place this sun thing? I'll just put it over there somewhere. But wait. It has to be exactly where it is. And earth has to be exactly where it is. And all the plants have to be exactly where it is. He didn't just say, just put it over there somewhere. I don't want to deal with it. I'm not into details. Is God a God of details? I don't know. He knows how many hairs are on our head. Do you know how many hairs are on your head unless you're bald? The world is designed as well as everything that happens in your life. God is not, God has purpose behind everything he does in his creation, in his word, and even in tragedy. I thought it was fitting that we we're exactly 10 years past the events of September 11th, 2001. It amazes me that I have children on my bus, I drive buses for Branson, 5th grade through 8th grade. It amazes me that there are children on my bus that were not even born yet when September 11th happened. Even many high school students that don't even remember it, for they were a 
only four, five, six, seven maybe. I remember. Why am I bringing this up? Is it just because it's good pulling on heartstrings? You know me, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of pastor. But the title of this sermon is The Purpose of Everything. Normally we do not struggle with the purpose of happy things. I mean, if a cute little puppy jumps on your lap and goes, <laughs> you don't go, hmm, I wonder what the purpose of this is. A little girl wanders around on stage singing, I'm young, young. We don't go, hmm, I wonder what the purpose is. For that brings joy and happiness into our life. That's easy. But when tragedy comes, that's when we say, God, what is your purpose here? Why would you do this? Some believers, most unbelievers, say there is no purpose to tragedy. I do not know why I keep saying the noise. They say, when tragedy comes in your life, God didn't want that to happen. Satan just got by him somehow. That God did not want your child to die, your husband or wife to die, you to lose that money, you to lose your house, you to lose whatever. God didn't want that. It was Satan that did it to you. The problem is, that first means that things happen that God doesn't want to happen. Thus, he's not a very big God. If God's up there in heaven going, oh, I wish that would happen that way. How big of a God is he? He's a terribly small God. He's a little G God, if that's the God we serve. For those are the gods that can do nothing, that stand by and do nothing. Second, if God does not have a purpose for these things, we are left with nothing. We are left with no hope. As the person that is told that lost a child, God didn't want that to happen. It was Satan. All their hope has been taken away. Because if God has a reason for it, it's terrible. It's horrible. I hate it. But God had a purpose for it. If we say there is no purpose, this is random, we're lost. We have no purpose in our life. Why do you think so many children commit suicide? So many people commit suicide? Do you think it's because they have a hope? What causes them to commit suicide? They have no hope left. They are left with a life that they are told their entire life is random. And random stuff happens. And at any moment, you could die like that. And if you die like that, it's no big deal. You had no purpose in your life. What good is that? What good is that? No wonder people commit suicide. They have no hope. People that believe that have a total lack of understanding the God of the Bible. Right after 9-11 happened, some pastors came out and gave the reason why God, they thought God did this. They concluded that it was a result of the nation's sin and uh, our rejecting of him. The problem is, we can't say for sure that's why God did it. We can't say for sure. We can't say for sure that's not why God did it either. God might have been disciplining our nation for abortion and rejecting him and throwing him out of everything we do. Saying, wake up, wake up. But we can't say for sure that was God's purpose because it's not revealed to us in his word. We can't say that must be the reason why. It may be for something totally different. I cannot say, was it, was it for that purpose? But I can't say God does discipline nations. So it could be as well. But let's hang on to a definite purpose. Can we have a definite purpose revealed in the scripture why tragedy happens? Yes, we can. Jesus spoke about this very thing in Luke. He said this. He, uh, they said, There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galatians who blood Pilate had mingled 
with their sacrifice. Pilate had come in, there were some Galatians in there, and they were making their sacrifice, and their army came in and killed them all. So their blood and the blood of the sacrifice were mingled together. That was a tragedy. And he said to them, Jesus said, Do you think that these Galatians were worse sinners than all the other Galatians? Because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or the 18 of whom the tower of Shalom fell and killed them. You think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. They were under the thought that bad things happen to bad people. We understand that not all tragedy happens just because bad people. Look at poor Job, though. Job is suffering. How do his friends come along and go, Hey, Job, we feel you. And after a while they say, this must, you really must have sinned against God. He goes, no, I didn't. I'm not aware of any great sin that I did. Now, obviously, he was a sinner. But God said, this isn't, this isn't about that. What about, I love this, a man born blind his entire life. And Jesus' disciples are walking by and see this man, and they ask this question. They say, Jesus, was it this man's sin or his parents' sin that he was born blind? They did a something false logically. They did a, a false falsity of logic. It was an either or have to be. Well, this poor man was born blind, so it must have been either his sin or his parents' sin. What was Jesus' reply? The purpose that this man was born blind was to bring glory to me. Wow! This man suffered his entire life until that point to bring glory to God. Wow! What does Christ point to as a result of this tragedy? Did he say, because this tower fell, or because this army came in and wiped out these people, did he say how bad these people were that they died? Did he go on and say how we should punish those that cause tragedy? Did he say how should we stop these future tragedies? Christ is not saying that some of these aren't, we're not saying that these are not important. But they're not the real thing we should be looking at through tragedy. What we must be understanding is that we must repent and turn to Christ. That's the point Christ is saying. They said, weren't these people, must they have been bad that this tragedy happened? Weren't these people that came over and attacked us, aren't they bad? And he said, neither here nor there. Unless you repent... You will perish like them. That is his point. Now some of you might be familiar with a poem that was written right after 9-11. The poem is called Meet in the Stairwell, written by Stacy Randolph following September 11th, 2001. Written from the perspective of God, where was God? And what was God doing during the tragic moments of September 11th? The original poem was placed on a family website that is circulated throughout the world via email. The poem is on thousands of websites, currently estimate 8,000 websites. On November 30th, 2001, Bob Holliday, produ production manager of Kfish, Los Angeles, read the poem over Manhattan Steamrollers' Silent Night. Bob's version found its way on hundreds of radio stations throughout the world. It was finally, uh, uh, what I find amazing about this poem is that it points us to what Christ points us to. A horrible as a tragedy is, the reason that you were not involved because it was not your time. But take this time to seek Him. Otherwise, I tell you, that unless you repent, you will likewise perish.
say you'll never forget where you were when you heard the news on September 11th, 2001. Neither will I. I was on the 110th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I held his finger steady as he dialed. I gave him a piece to say, Honey, I'm not going to make it. But it's okay, I'm ready to go. I was with his wife when he called as she fed breakfast to their children. I held her up as she tried to understand his words. And as she realized he wasn't coming home that night. I was in the stairwell of the 23rd floor when a woman cried out to me for help. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for 50 years. I said, of course, I'll show you the way home. Only believe in me now. I was at the base of the building when the priest ministered to the injured and devastated souls. I took him home to tend his flock in heaven. He heard my voice and answered. I was on all four of those planes, in every seat, with every prayer. I was with the crew as they were overtaken. I was in the very hearts of the believers there, comforting and assuring them that their faith has saved them. I was in Texas, Kansas, London. I was standing next to you when you heard the terrible news. Did you sense me? I want you to know that I saw every face. I knew every name, though not all knew me. Some met me for the first time on the 86th floor. Some sought me with their last breath. Some couldn't hear me calling to them through the smoke and flames. Come to me, this way, take my hand. Some chose, for the final time, to ignore me. But I was there. I did not place you in the tower that day. I not know why, but I do. However, if you were there at that explosive moment in time, would you have reached for me? September 11th, 2001 was not the end of the journey for you. Someday your journey will end, and I'll be there for you as well. Seek me now while I may be found. Then, at any moment, you know you're ready to go. I will be in the stairwell of your final moments. I didn't play the video to just get an emotional response.
but we are commanded to weep with those who weep. But this poem echoes Christ when he said, Seek me now while I may be found. Then at any moment, we'll know you're ready to go. And the poem concludes with the, the guy added, I remember I always love you, but the original poem ended with, I think, the profound words. I will be in the stairwell for five minutes. <clears throat> the purpose of everything is clear. First, the purpose of everything is to bring glory to God. That is the purpose of all. Ultimately, to bring Him glory. Amen. The second purpose of everything is to point us to Him, which reflects back to the first purpose, to bring glory to God. That is the purpose of all this. This is the purpose of everything you encounter in your life. This is the purpose of His creation. This is the purpose of His revelation in the world. This is the purpose of relationship. This is the purpose of children. This is the purpose of everything He has created. God established Hagar and Sarah along with the entire Old and New Testament to point us to Him, to reflect Him. God established all creation to point us to Him. And God established a horrible terrorist attack on September 11th to point us to Him. Everything is to bring Him glory and point us to Him. Remember that. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your word and your truth. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for all you have given us, all the ways that we can stand before you and see you revealing yourself to us. We thank you, God, for showing us your way, your truth, making us ready so when we face our end, we will not eternally perish but have eternal life in you. We thank you, God, that you have washed away our sins by your work on the cross. That you have placed your righteousness upon us through your righteous life. We just thank you and give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus Christ, one name. Amen. Amen. May the mighty one who has done great things and whose mercy goes on from generation to generation, when life's perils confound you, may his counsel guide you and beneath his wings protect you. May God be with you